My name's Tanner. I'm here with Thrust Flight in the Addison location. And today we're gonna talk about a student pilot emergency. All right, so if you're watching this, you probably have already heard of this incident. Uh, whenever something like this happens, of course, it uh, tends to permeate pretty quickly throughout the aviation community here. But there was an incident a little while ago up in Pontiac, Michigan, that we're going to talk about today. There was a student pilot solo who was flying a Diamond DA-20 out of the airport up there, and they unfortunately lost their nose wheel. Their entire nose gear assembly came off when they rotated off on takeoff there. And it just shows how great of a community that we have here in the aviation industry, that we had two aircraft that were taken off or in the pattern already near that airport both with flight instructors and they were able to help her out and get her back safely on the ground so let's take a look at a little clip here from that video and uh, we'll talk about it here in a second diamond eight delta charlie did you copy copy eight delta charlie your entire front wheel assembly is on the runway roger that um should i remain in the pattern diamond eight delta charlie you tell me what you need affirmative it is eight delta charlie by yourself. I am solo. Hey, I'm a flight instructor in 3, I could really need any help. I would uh, love a bit of assistance, 8 Delta Charlie. All right, uh, 8 Delta Charlie, uh, go ahead and get yourself set up for a normal pattern. Keep yourself nice and controlled, and make sure you just run through your checklist here. And uh, let me know when you're established to the downwind. All right, so now that we've seen that clip, let's break it down a little bit. The hardest part for us about this video is that there's not a whole lot to react to. They did everything right. It was uh, very, very well done by the student pilot, by ATC, by both of those flight instructors and those other two aircraft. So I'm just gonna kind of give my two cents here on what happened, not necessarily why it happened or how maybe it could have been handled better, but just what I would do if I was in that situation as the pilot and what I would do in that situation is if I was an instructor. So um, again, obviously I wouldn't be an instructor instructor in the aircraft, it was a student solo, but I actually had to use this example with a student of mine the other day and it worked perfectly. One of the things that we talk about as instructors a lot um, when we're talking about our soft field landings is keeping the nose wheel off the ground, protecting the nose wheel, right? And that's easy to say and it's easy to kind of put it in the perspective of you know landing on grass or landing on a, a ragged airstrip, something like that. But another example that I use a lot when I'm teaching these soft field landings is you don't have a nose gear, right? Your nose gear fell off, your tires popped, right? Something's wrong and you no longer have a nose gear. You wanna keep that nose elevated as long as possible before you let it touch the ground. And that's exactly the advice that these flight instructors uh, helping this diamond gave her when she was coming back into the airport and it worked perfectly. So the first thing that you really need to kind of know in any emergency, especially in a small aircraft, is of course fly the airplane, run your checklists, and the airplane now belongs to the insurance company. So your safety is number one. So it needs to not be, man, I hope I don't get my ratings pulled for this. Man, I hope, you know, I don't bend up the airplane too bad after this, right? It's get yourself back on the ground safely as possible. And you're gonna do that by taking away as many unknowns as you can. So what happened is this Diamond Star took off, they lost the nose wheel, it still flies like an airplane, right? Maybe there's a little change in performance, but they're probably not going to feel a whole lot of difference in the weight and balance. They're not gonna feel a whole lot of difference in the way that the aircraft handles. So now what they need to do is just fly straight and level, get their head about them, figure out what they're gonna do next, tell ATC what they're gonna do next, and then go in and execute that plan. So one of the things that I thought was really interesting about this that just shows how well the student had been trained and how well they ran their checklists was they had the time to squawk their you know 7700 for an emergency, right? That's absolutely optional. And why I say it's optional is if your airplane is in such bad shape that you can't have that time or you don't have that time to press those four numbers into your transponder, I would so much rather you fly the airplane all day than uh, worry about punching a code into a computer, right? If you're talking to ATC or even if you're not, they know something's wrong and they're gonna help you with it. But they had the time, the student had the time to go out, fly straight and level, get a feel for the airplane, still run their emergency checklist, squawk 7700, and they were able to get help back from those flight instructors that were in those other aircraft. So what they ended up doing is flying, uh, I believe it was north just a little bit. Again, they got their wits about them. They uh, made, a, it would have been, I guess, an eastbound turn, right? And just did some patterns. And that's perfect. Again, the airplane isn't low on fuel. There's not anything in immediate danger. There's no uh, engine failures, fires. There's no medical emergencies. 
So they're just flying it like they normally would, right? They're just trying to get it back on the ground as safely as they can. So they were able to make a couple of practice approaches first. And uh, when they did that, it was again, just, you know, kind of more breaking through those mental barriers than anything else. There's not a whole lot necessarily that they needed to practice differently that they should have been doing different than any other landing. Again, it, it, it's just a soft field landing. Now, depending on where this student was in their training, they might not have known what a soft field landing was. They might not have known, you know, maybe had as much practice on it. And maybe even so, even if they were near the end of their training, a private pilot still only has so much practice on soft field landings, but if they know the concept, maybe if they've done it a couple of times, and actually I think I do remember them saying in the video that they were going to treat it like a normal soft field landing, and that's exactly right. That's a great way of thinking of it. So they came in, they did a couple of practice approaches, right? Just making sure that they had positive control of the aircraft, kind of get a, a good feel of the stick, making sure that they're thinking what they're going to do on this next lap of keeping the, uh, the nose wheel up and keeping that propeller from impacting the ground, right? And again, this is a, a, a relatively small sink single engine, there shouldn't be a whole lot of torque or anything that they need to deal with on landing. They're not carrying any passengers or dealing with any potentially hazardous cargo. They're not carrying a whole lot of fuel. So pretty much on, on landing, the only thing that this really is going to do differently than a normal landing is be a bit louder when that prop hits the ground. And again, that's so much easier to say sitting here in an armchair in an air-conditioned building than it is in the actual aircraft. But that's the kind of minds that, that you need to have when dealing with these emergencies. If the plane is flying like it normally is, right? If there's no change in how the aircraft handles, then the landing needs to be as it normally would. Fly a regular pattern, run all your checklists like you normally would, and then come in and just treat it like, you know, a, a soft foot landing. So there are some aircraft POHs that have specific procedures called out for landing without one of the three tires. I'm not sure if that DA-20 has it. A lot of it just boils down to them printing out the, uh, the words that all pilots are kind of trained to, which is just keep that wheel off the ground as long as possible. So if we lose our nose wheel, I'm going to land on the two mains like I normally would. I'm going to keep that nose wheel off. I'm just going to ride a wheelie down along the runway as best I can and then slowly lower that nose. I don't want it to slam down. That could cause more problems, but I want to slowly lower that nose that prop's gonna get real loud for a second i'll pull my fuel to cut off whatever there's a couple of schools of thoughts of when to pull your engine power out or if you stop the engine on short final that kind of thing right again going back to that that third point that i made earlier of of the airplane now belongs to the insurance company i don't care if you own it or if it's a flight school airplane right just getting that in your head is really going to help you be safe as opposed to doing things differently to save the pocketbook later is i'm going to fly that airplane i'm going to keep that engine turning all the way and until it's stopped. So I don't want to burst into flames or anything like that, but I'm not going to try to pull my power to idle or pull my mixture to idle or anything like that shortly before I touch down because that changes the whole dynamic of the way the plane flies. And now I've removed my option of a go around as well. So if I'm coming in and I don't have a nose wheel and I'm coming in and I, I don't like this approach, maybe I get nervous, maybe there's something on the runway I don't like. If I've now pulled my mixture to cut off, I can't go around. I'm committed to that landing. But if I keep that power going, I can still go around before that prop impacts. Obviously, I don't want to go around if I've had a prop strike, go around, give it another attempt, right? And then I just fly it to the ground, right? So I'm going to touch with my mains first, and then that prop's going to keep turning. I'm going to have power to idle, but that prop's going to keep turning and it's going to turn into the ground. It's going to hit the ground. It's going to be loud. It's going to throw chunks of debris, right? But that engine is not so powerful that that prop is going to keep turning after a couple of impacts, especially on a smaller aircraft like this. Again, always read your operator's manual. If it tells you something different on a different plane, do that instead. But on these small ones where these procedures don't really exist, just keep that engine turn and then keep positive control of the aircraft, fly that airplane first. And then as you start slowing down and you don't need to maintain directional control anymore because you don't have any to maintain. You're not steering with anything. Now I can pull my mixture to cut off so I don't catch on fire. Now I can turn my fuel selector off, right? That kind of thing. But until that happens, run your emergency checklist like you would, but you want to keep everything the same. You don't want to do anything different than you would on a normal day. Even on a complete engine failure, we still train to fly downwind base and final. Because once you get down to that thousand feet above AGL, if I'm just doing a straight in to uh, like an off-field site, right, for an engine failure, I am now have a different perspective than what I'm used to. But if I do downwind base final, it's now a normal traffic pattern. It helps alleviate the stress that I have, as well as now I know how the airplane is going to perform in that because I've done it before. I've done it a thousand times, whether I'm a private pilot who's just done patterns or I'm a commercial pilot who's maybe practiced some power off 180s, right? I have that sight picture. And uh, again, it helps relieve a lot of the tension that I would be feeling in that emergency, as well as now I know how the aircraft handles in that state.
So again, this student pilot, again, fantastic job from her and the two instructors, fantastic job from ATC with the communication there, helping her at the beginning before those instructors popped on. Her first question is, should I remain in the pattern? ATC says, you tell me what you need. And that's exactly what we need to hear from them. So a lot of the times too, you're a little bit in shock at the very beginning when that stuff's happening. You're like, well, what do I do? Do I stay in the pattern? Do I go out from the pattern? Do I come back? Do I, is there anything special I need to do? And um, it is, it's, it's, you're, you're in that cockpit. You're making those commands decisions, right? That's what you're getting trained for as a private pilot is, is how to take control of the situation, how to take control of that aircraft and make those decisions that you need. And that's okay if it takes a couple of attempts, right? So do I stay in the pattern? That's a very logical first question. And they say, tell me what you need. It kind of maybe jumps you out of that or, you know, shocks you out of that, uh, that state. And you're saying, well, yeah, I guess I do need to stay in the pattern or uh, yeah, I think I need to come back and land. Well, now that you've made the decision to come back and land, how do you do that? It's amazing to see that we have such a great community with these two flight instructors that we're able to just jump on and, and give really good advice. Neither of them were just trying to be a hero or anything. They, they truly seem to care about the student in there because we've all been there. Every single pilot, that is their worst nightmare is, you know, going up on a solo and something happens and there's no one there to help you, right? And then while you're trained, how to do these things, it really makes a difference to have someone there with some experience able to help out in a situation like this. All right, y'all, that uh, wraps it up today on this student solo emergency. We don't often do videos like these, so if you would like to uh, see more types of this content, some more uh, reviews of these types of incidents, leave a comment down below. If you have any questions, leave a comment down below. And don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos.